Hello and a very warm welcome to our live employer masterclass session from the Change in Education Group. This is an opportunity for employers to give you, the students, a real insight into their world of work. My name is Amos Madre, your host and careers advisor here at the Change in Education Group. Joining me today is Peter Archer, who's a consultant working for Chevron managing safe work as team lead. The primary purpose of the managing safe work or MSW coaches program is to prevent serious injuries and fatalities through assurance engagements of high risk activities by subject matter experts. Peter's a real globetrotter. We've been talking about his trips around the world. He joins us now live from Kazakhstan. Peter, good evening to you. Good evening, how are you doing? I'm <laughs> good, thank you. How's uh, things over there in Kazakhstan? It's uh, it's surprisingly warm compared to the UK. I've only just uh, just got here a couple of nights ago. So, uh, yeah, it's about 30 degrees. So, yeah, quite quite pleasant, actually, at the moment. <laughs> Very nice. Lucky for some. Um, so, obviously, uh, your job involves a lot of travelling. I can imagine the past 12 months have been uh, quite a bit of a journey for you. Can you tell us about how things have panned out for you? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I've, I've been used to travelling for work for over 20 years now, and, um, and normally I travel at least twice a month. Um, now, with all of the restrictions and stuff, it's just got a lot harder to do anything. Um, when I when I have to travel now, I've got a ream of paperwork, I've got to have government approvals, I've got exemptions for me not to be isolating and things like this, because... We're working on live facilities, and in theory, I could be called back at any time. Um, so yeah, it's just it's just a lot a lot more difficult to travel. But as long as you do have the right paperwork, it's fairly painless. Um, unfortunately, I saw it again this week going through um, Heathrow and through Frankfurt airports. People there that are just arguing because they haven't got the right paperwork. And, uh, and all they're doing is getting very upset and then they're just going to get carted off and, and dealt with. So, uh, yeah, if you're going to do it, if you're going to travel, plan ahead, make sure you get all your paperwork. That's my, yeah. my recommendations <laughs> in the COVID era. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I think you need a PhD these days to travel, don't oh, you? Honestly, uh, it's a moving uh, yeah. target. It's yeah. a moving the, target. Yeah, and the cost of it as well. I mean, obviously, you've got to do your PCR test. Yeah, of course, testing negative that's the first hurdle, yeah. And then, uh, secondly, it's just the cost of the travel itself whether you're going to red list country, and if you are, that means isolation costing you almost two thousand pounds on return right. as well. So, yeah, yeah, quite a lot to think about. Um, and I'm conscious of time because I know that <laughs> uh, soon you're gonna have to have uh, uh, another test, uh, yes, as part that's right, of, uh yeah. protocols. Okay, so let's try and get through as much as we can. Uh, yeah, sure. That we have. So, um, so t- t- tell us about your journey, your career journey. Where did it all start? At what point did you realise this is the path for you? So I, um, I did an apprenticeship um, in the UK as, a, as an electrician. Um, I did that for a company in Oxford. They were still there. Um, they're probably one of the oldest construction-based electrical engineering companies in Oxford. Um, I finished my apprenticeship and I decided to go self-employed as I did, you know, back in the, in the early, the late nineties, uh, sorry, early nineties, late eighties, 89, 90 sort of thing. And, um, I went to work up in London and I actually worked on Canary Wharf when that was being built. So at the time, um, obviously the UK was in quite a big recession and, um, and we were all earning fairly good money of traveling up to London every day. It was a bit of a slog. Um, and I got approached by one of the architects on uh, on one of the jobs there to go and do a job for him that he just landed, funnily enough, in Kazakhstan. And that was the uh, for the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. So I headed up a team of guys, mechanical and electrical guys, to go and work on the new embassy in Kazakhstan when it was being built. And that was in 1991. And that was my first job overseas. And uh, from there on... Um, I was there for about a year or so, uh, came back to the UK for a short period. The same guy then picked up some work for BP in Azerbaijan. And he asked me to go over and, and do the same. And uh, that was supposed to be a six-week job, and I ended up spending 12 years there. And I ended up working for BP in the end. 
and that's what got me into oil and gas. Incredible. And yeah. um, it's it's the process side of it, not the exploration that you're doing, isn't it? Yeah, well, you know, in the in the in the twenty odd years that I've been in oil and gas, I've worked on both. Um, I've worked in in the Sahara, in Libya, and Algeria on uh, on exploration, all the way through to startup. So um, where I've actually been out with the drilling crews, um, setting up temporary camps in the desert, and then going right the way through to um, the front engineering and design of the of the terminal build. Um, and then I've been the, the client representative there for the, the build and the construction, the commissioning and startup. So, you know, straight from drilling all the way out to process, you know. Yeah. You know, when you were in the Sahara, were there times where you pinched yourself and thought, how on earth did an apprentice end up here? Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> it's the most beautiful place on the planet, honestly. At times it's bizarre. It's, uh, it's, a, it's, it's a very, uh, very hypnotic place. <laughs> I can imagine yeah. um, you, you didn't have those mirages like they do in the films where you're looking for an oasis and <laughs> looking for only, only used to happen when the, when the crew changes came in and someone <laughs> used to bring special bottles in yeah <laughs> <laughs> but yeah no generally it, it was uh, most of these situations for us certainly in, in oil and gas in exploration uh, and in construction if you're working internationally on remote sites most of it's dry anyway, so I do jest. But we used to have the occasional, occasional surprise where we might uh, somebody brings in something for us and we have a little celebration, you know. Yeah, I mean, again, you know, looking at um, where your uh, career started as an apprentice um, and now, you know, with, where things are today, there's so many people who are really looking at this apprenticeship route and valuing. Uh, what it has to offer, you get the best Absolutely. of the world because not only do you get your qualifications, but you're getting practical training as well. So you really do uh, get, uh, you know, get great rewards out of it. And I, I, I suspect, you know, you are a great ambassador for that. Um, Absolutely, and, yeah. You know, for where your career is now. Um, from Absolutely. Where it Absolutely. You know, yeah. you've always you've always got it to fall back on. Um, and, it, and it's interesting when I when I got into oil and gas, especially when I when I was working for BP in Azerbaijan, and and then went on to Georgia with them and various other countries. They saw the value of having um, trade qualified people going into the world of of construction safety, which is what I'm primarily responsible now for. You know, I'm there with their part of the prevention team to stop the people that are constructing our facilities killing themselves. You know, serious injury or fatalities. But you have to have uh, the governance of these programs and of these activities by people who know the trade. It's no good picking somebody fresh out of school and saying, right, you're in charge of safety on this multi-billion dollar project because they have no experience. But that's why me and all the team that work for me, the 60 odd guys that I've got, we've, we're all um, time served people in various disciplines. And so when we go out to these construction sites, bearing in mind our site at the moment, uh, we have one site that's got nearly 14,000 people on it on a daily basis. On site, on our project, we have a POB, a, a daily POB of around, at the moment, around 55,000 people in a remote mm -hmm. location. So, you know, trying to keep that amount of people safe every day is a huge undertaking. And we've got something like, uh, I think now we're up to 26 or 27 nationalities as well. So Incredible. Yeah. yeah so you need incredible. people there who have the, the hands-on experience of how to deal with this, you know? Does that sort of pressure ever get to you? Does, do you feel overwhelmed? Um, I wouldn't say I do because I'm confident in what we do and I'm confident that what we deliver is understandable. Our, ours is about our our premise really is about building relationships with with the guys with the work crews and making sure they understand our expectations as a company when it comes to safety that we won't tolerate any shortcuts things like this because ultimately you know they might not understand but if we have a an injury or a fatality that goes back to our lenders that goes back to the world bank that affects our share price um you know the knock-on effect of all of this looks really bad and is really bad for us as a company and our standing in the host nations things like that you know there's a lot of answers to be had whenever we have incidents so 
if we can remain incident and injury free, it, it's it's better for everybody. Everybody goes home safe every day, and that's what we want. Number one, you know, we can replace equipment, we can replace um, any of the materials that might be wrong or, or get broken or whatever. We can't replace people, and that and that's that's our our, our number one mantra, if you like. Yeah, um, compliance is really important, and it really Absolutely, safety yeah. comes first. Um, really important. Um, I mean, you look at what happened in the Gulf um, of Mexico with BP. Um, I know they're competitors uh, to your organisation, but you know you could see that that sent shockwaves right across the sector. And um, yeah, safety and compliance to safety is uh, vital. Um, so tell to us about um, Chevron and, of course, uh, the, the part it has to play in all of this. And, um, you know, you are the trainer of trainers as well. Tell us <laughs> yeah. a bit about that as well. Yeah, so the, um, the MSW programme that we've developed here in, in Kazakhstan is, um, is pretty unique. We do have this programme globally, um, but our programme here is the only one that has subject matter experts i.e. time-served, uh, discipline-based people on the team. Um, in the rest of our global operations, the MSW team are made up from um, process engineers or safety guys, and we do have a, uh, a, a programme uh, document which gives the, the guidelines of the programme and how they have to engage with contractors and personnel, etc. But the, the difference is with us that we have got discipline-specific experts if you like for each of the uh, for each of the disciplines so this is just to make sure that that we give clear guidance support and, and coaching and motivation to the, the contractors we'll watch them work and if there's anything that we think they can improve this is where we come in maybe we might you know it's only a positive engagement which happens quite a lot of the time you know because we're the stuff that we're teaching the guys as we go along this is all based on our experience of working on projects like this all over the world, you know. Um, so it's it's um, it's a good it's a good a pro, a sort of um, opportunity to build relationships with the work crews on site. We do get to know them. We have an element of trust because all of the engagements that we that we deliver and that we engage with the work crews with we document, but everything's anonymous. So we've got a system in place that goes into a database uh, through an application called check it. And, um, and what we do, we enter all of the information about the engagement, about what we spoke about, maybe what was wrong, what was right. And we can analyze that. And we do every month to give ourselves sort of lagging and leading indicators. If we can see stuff that's coming up on the horizon that, you know, we've seen this on a few sites now and there's a lot of this behavior going on. This is something we need to concentrate on. So it's um it's quite a it's quite an interesting tool to use, yeah. and um, and it's got really positive feedback from the construction crews, you know. So yeah, they yeah. they uh, they really like it. Yeah, I I think it's um, good that you've got the trust uh, of the um, the crews, and of course, uh, being able to review and see where things are each month as well helps, and the accountability you've got all the stats to prove of everything that you've been doing. Um, coaching, why has it become so important in, in this industry? I think because um, we're, we're finding, especially when we, when we work on these mega projects, we have to find thousands of people to come and work in a remote location. Uh, and they're all, and all projects are all very much short term. So this is, you know, they're all jumping from project to project. So, unless you're actually working for Chevron themselves, potentially as our subcontractors, they might be here for a year, 18 months, two years maximum on a five-year project. So it's, um, it's all about the sort of stability of the workforce and making sure that we do get competent people to come on site. So we, you know, before anybody comes to site to work, irrespective of whether they're uh, the maintenance man working in the office building or the, or the, the CFO, they have to go through a specific induction. They have to go through a week specific training. Um, they have to go through all of the uh, ROK, the Kazakhstan requirements for employment and for employment in remote locations to make sure they have a level of competency 
before they actually arrive on site. And all of our mentoring is something that takes this to the next level with the disciplines as well, because we have discipline specific training for, for guys that are working at height, i.e. scaffolders or uh, pipe fitters for, you know, working with vessels under pressure, electricians, you name it. You know, we've got all of this system in place where we almost have to sort of pre-qualify and then continue to mentor these people. Because if I, if I showed you the, uh, the Chevron rules, if you like, on, on construction safety, it, there's like volumes, about 10 of them that thick. And you'll say, right, okay, welcome to site Amos, read these and we'll see you on Monday morning. <laughs> And then you're expect to know everything, you know, and it and it just you know it doesn't work like that. So yeah. this is where experience comes in, you know. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, great advice from the coach there. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, what what do you enjoy and what do you not enjoy so much? Um, in my position as the team lead, the biggest headache for me is all the HR stuff I have to deal with within uh, within my team. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, dealing with all of the uh, permissions and flights and approvals and this and that and electronic <laughs> signatures for every document. And, yeah, oh God, it's just a nightmare. <laughs> I would much rather be out on site all day, every day, because that's yeah. what I love. It's what I love to do. And I'm happy doing it. I think I'm good at doing it as well, you know. But, unfortunately, I do get dragged down and dragged into a lot of meetings about meetings about meetings you know <laughs> but it is what it is that's you know that's the nature of the beast yeah um now there'll be a lot of students watching this who um, are in science technology engineering and maths and um they'll be curious to want to know you know what steps they can take what advice would you offer to them and in fact anybody who's considering a career uh, in, in your field it, it's interesting how it's changed over the last few years where, you know, every country that I have to go to work to, um, they want to see your CV. They want to see your qualifications. Um, everybody wants a degree. Now, no matter what country you go to, they want a degree or an equivalent. Luckily for me, I've got my trade um, diplomas and I've also got my safety diplomas as well, which um a very, very specific, the Nibosh stuff that takes me through into, into oil and gas, plus with my um, work experience as well and all the, the other qualifications that I've got working um, for companies like BP and Chevron, etc. cetera. Um, qualifications are the biggest thing. Make sure, take the time, take the effort, get the qualifications, because once you've got them, you've got them. You know, as, as a wise man once said to me, you're better off looking at them than looking for them. <laughs> so that would be my probably my number one recommendation make sure you get the qualifications the experience will come and you just have to be patient um you need to make sure you network and, and, and get to know the right people when you're certainly in the oil and gas industry it's like a village you know before pre-covid i could almost guarantee any time i went to an airport whether it was amsterdam frankfurt heathrow wherever I would bump into someone that I'd worked with in the last 20 years in one of the lounges. It's just spooky how it happens. It's like a village. Yeah. And once you're in that, that process with oil and gas, I've never, believe it or not, applied for a job in oil and gas in my life. I've always been contacted and headhunted or recommended, call this guy, there's a job waiting for you. You know, and that, that is the way it works with the oil and gas industry. Seems to me, anyway. <laughs> you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's an incredible uh, field to be working in. Yeah. Um, there's so many things that change and so many things are going on in that industry. Safety is, of course, very important. Um, but like you said, it's a village, it's a community. And there's always that camaraderie, um, regardless yeah. of where you are, when you do meet with each other in the airports or where, whether you're on site as well. There's that Absolutely. Community spirit there so uh, really important in that industry wow uh, thank you so much i'm conscious of your time i know that you need to have your test very soon so yes um, they'll be before... knock, knocking on the door shortly <laughs> <laughs> before we let you go um is there any way that we can our audience can connect on linkedin are you there or is there i am but i do tend not to try and get on it when i'm at work because you just get swallowed away with it but certainly <laughs> if uh 
if you want to uh, to email me with any questions, please, not a problem. Fantastic. Well, Peter, thank you so much for spending the afternoon or your evening <laughs> with us. Uh, really do appreciate it. What a fantastic story uh, from Canary Wharf. I can imagine from that single tower, uh, when you go past these days, I'm sure you're trying to spot where it is. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it brings back memories. Every time we fly into London, always look out the window and see it. <laughs> and to where you are now it's incredible uh, I wish you all the very best keep safe and thank you for spending your evening with us pleasure thank you all right take care so guys there you have it thank you very much indeed uh, for your company on this virtual work experience program I can't believe it's come to an end already what an incredible week we've had uh, we've already received um, all your project briefs and uh, your uh, elevator pitches as well. I've had a few people who've uh, asked me a few questions about the elevator pitch. You can do it in video, audio, or a blog format, whichever is uh, easiest for you. Uh, feel free to do it in any, in any one of those ways and send that over to us. And of course, uh, a lot of you have been trying to connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, I will make sure uh, I reach out to you. Thank you very much indeed. Well, from Peter, from myself, from all the team here at the Changing Education Group, thank you very much for this fantastic week that we've had. I wish you guys all the very best in what you do. Good luck. Take care. Bye-bye. 